Douglas, who's the head of our grants office here at the Grad Center and is a great resource for students and faculty who want to apply for find grants, apply for grants, and uh, yeah. all that good stuff. So. Um, so my email address, before I forget to tell you what it is, is egonzalez3, so it's E-G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-C, -E number three, at gc.uni.edu. You have to put a three on it or I won't get it and you'll think I'm ignoring you. The second thing, I'm not. The second thing I want to tell you is that I get a tremendous load of emails a day, like really a tremendous amount, more than any human should possibly get in a day. So if I do not respond to you, if you don't get an auto, out of office, I'm gone. And I don't respond to you within you know, a, a complete cycle of a business day, send me the same, just send me the same email again and just put number two or second try or something in the subject heading so I know it's a second time you're asking me the same question. I promise that I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And I will not get offended if you continue to say, hey, where the heck are you? I'm expecting a response from you. It's just, it's helpful. And I'm sorry to make you go through that, but, like I said, I, I get a, a, such a tremendous number that I will have read your email and not had enough time to formulate a response to get it back to you. And if you just prompt me again, and as long as you're not offended by the fact I haven't responded, I won't be offended by you saying, hey, you haven't responded. So that's the deal I think we should have together. Um, it's also really helpful if you're writing to me about a, anything specific that's coming up to tell me the first question I'm going to ask is what's the deadline so if you tell me immediately like I just found out about this opportunity I'm applying for funding it's due in five days which will make me go like ah! when I read it yeah. but um, it's helpful that I have the information right away because then I will know do I you know is it due in six weeks and I can you know, get back to you in two days or is it due in five days and I need to answer you yesterday so again like just it's helpful for me if I know what your deadlines are um, my office handles, the, um, we're the Office of Research and Sponsor Program, so we handle all externally funded uh, programs, projects, research that's happening at the Graduate Center. Um, I almost said we're not a bank. We're not a bank, but we do have a small um, grants program that's run through our office and it's called the Doctoral Student Research Grant Program. It's open to students in year two, and uh, I think between years two and six, or two and seven, I forget. Um, the person who runs it, her name is Adrian Klein. Mine's A. Klein, at gc.edu. And it is about $1,500. Um, traveling research money for students and why I usually bring it up to students, especially in political science and other social sciences, is if you have a travel aspect to your um, research, finding money just for travel is sometimes challenging. And the other reason I bring it up is this is money that you can use to travel to a conference at which you are not presenting. And that is also rare to find. So if you want to go to to a conference and just attend the conference. This is a source of funding you can apply for to do that. Um, and again, it's the Doctoral Student Research Grant Program. And that is an internal and internal grant competition. It's not an external one. OK. So basically, students get funded in two ways. They either get funded that is directly to the student. You apply for money, it's a set amount, they say yes or no, they send you a check. If they say yes, you deposit the check, and I will know nothing about it. You will just apply on your own, and they'll send the check directly to you, and everybody's happy. There are other kinds um, of grants and, and that usually happens, I'm going to stay with that for a second. That usually happens to students who are very early in their career, before you've um, advanced to candidacy, before you're actually working on your dissertation. It's usually while you're still doing coursework, is usually when you get those kind of grants. They go to the individual. The other kind of grants focus more on the exact research that you're doing. So instead of 
needing to know about who you are as a student and assessing your potential as a student and contributor to your field. The other type is really looking at the research and saying what is your research contributing to the field. Um, in those kinds of grants, the, the majority of those type of grants come to the institution. So that's when you would really need to see me. And I'm not saying I won't help you on the other kind of course. I, I just wouldn't, I might not be aware that that, that particular um, deadline is approaching because it's something that usually is between the student and the, institute and the funding agency. I will be most aware of the ones that the funds come to the institution and the institution gives them to the student. The way that sets up at CUNY is we have another entity that's called the Research Foundation. And they are the bank, but they only take your money, they don't <laughs> I mean, they operate as a bank. They take your money and they give it back to you, and they are the fiscal agent. So they, it is, it's, a, it's a whole entity that's basically comprised, um, that's uh, composed of lawyers and accountants. And they make sure that any contract you've entered into is, you're protected. They do legal review of things, the legal review of your grant uh, agreements, and they disperse your money in a way that um, is fiscally responsible. They generate, they do the fiscal reporting for you at the end of the grant period. So they provide a service for you. They are the fiscal agent for all of the CUNY campuses. And they're called the Research Foundation. Okay, those are all the players. Um, what, at which level are you all, since we're a small group, like are you? Two. Level two, two, one. Well, I'm, I'm not a student anymore, oh, I just finished. Okay. <laughs> I'm on my way out, I'm looking for a grant. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. awesome. Okay, good. Then, then uh, it's all good. We got the whole range. One, one, two, one. Oh, all right. All right, we have a whole range. All right. So, the first step is figuring out to where you're going to apply. Right. Search, doing the search. The search um, is the part that most people don't, there are two, two places where people usually have time management issues in looking for grants and applying for grants. The first one is doing the first initial search. It takes some time. Um, the Graduate Center <coughs> subscribes to a couple of different databases that will help you in your search. One is called Pivot. And Pivot, um, so if you go on the library's webpage, the, the, they have the little tabs of the A to Z databases. Pivot, P-I-V-O-T, is the one that will give you um, a list of funding opportunities. So there is an actual competition associated with each of the, um, uh, the lists in their database. The second database that you will usually use in conjunction is called the Foundation Directory Online. And the Foundation Directory is a list of funding agencies. So not necessarily, you know, we have this competition, it's due on June 1st, and you, you know, with all the requirements and regulations and guidelines for how to apply, it'll give you a funding agency, their areas that they like to fund in, who they normally fund, what their geographic area is, a lot about the funder. What, what is challenging about searching for funding is putting those two sets of information together. There's a third one, and it's called Grant Advisor Plus. And Grant Advisor Plus is usually just a chronological listing of, up, of upcoming deadlines. And it's grouped into very growth categories of social science, science, humanities, art, um, international, and health sciences, something like, like just really broad categories. But it gives you the next three months of deadlines that are coming up in any one of those. So what I, when I do a funding search, I usually start there and say, what are the next three months coming up? Are any of these remotely in my realm of this is what I do? And if they are, look at those first, because those are your, you know, you don't want to blow a deadline because you missed that it was happening. And if it's three months away, you've got a good shot at being able to pull together a good application. If it's a week away, 
depending on which one it is, how much you have written, that's uh, that's the judgment call for you when you get to it. But it's good to be aware that there are things coming up. The other thing that's good about um, that chronological list on Grant Advisor Plus is it'll list the agency, it lists who it's for, like is it a graduate student fellowship, is it a postdoc, is it a you know early career, what you know what is it, um, and it also gives you an entry point to say if this competition is open and it's really similar to what I do, but the level is off. So maybe it's for a postdoc, but you're still a graduate student. Look at it anyway. If you have time in your search, look at it anyway, because they may have also a pre-doctoral fellowship. So you just to, to look at that, it's a good way to kind of get a sense of who's funding what you do. For most people, um, to do a really thorough search, it's going to take hours to do a really thorough search. Um, I recommend going, you can go to the Foundation Center, and that's one nice thing about this campus. It's on Fifth Avenue and 16th Street. It's a short walk. Um, it is a library completely dedicated to funding, to finding funding sources. That's all, they, that's all the library is for. It's free. They have librarians to help you. They have workshops. They have all kinds of stuff going on down there. So Foundation, Direct, uh, Foundation Directory Online is the online resource of the Foundation Center Library on 16th and 5th. So if you're doing a search, good place to go. Our librarians to our research librarian, who is Sean Smith, she's incredibly helpful, but she's also, as most at CUNY now, incredibly overworked um, and has a lot on her plate. But the folks in the Minerist Library here will also be able to help you if you're doing a search and get stuck. So give it your best shot at first, and if nothing's coming up, you can ask for help in the library, and they might have some tricks up their sleeves for doing a more, for refining your search in a way that will get better results. Um, Oh, and so all of the, the databases, we subscribe to them for student use. We want you to use them, so please use them. And if, and if you find for any reason that they're just not working for you, um, you know, let us know. We like feedback on that because they're expensive and we want to know if we want to continue to do them, to, to subscribe to them. Um, As I said before, there are two, usually if you're trying to um, to work on a, a, a grant proposal, as you're doing your search, you want to make sure that what you're planning to do is well aligned with whatever the agency wants to fund. So when you're doing your search and you see something come up and you think, hey, that might be good for me, that sounds like what I do. The first thing you want to do is to read the eligibility requirements to make sure if you're even eligible to apply. I cannot tell you how often, and it's heartbreakingly often, that students and, and postdocs will come and say, I've been working on this proposal, it's almost ready to go in, here it is, ta-da. I'm ready to submit it, and they have invested a great deal of time and effort in preparing it. And I look at it and say, you know, this is only for U.S. citizens. And they're not. And that one, it, it happens a lot. So if, you're, if you are not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, let that be the first thing you check when you're looking for funding. Um, also, when you're, when you're first looking at it, check. If it starts asking, if it's saying that you need to be registered in any kind of system, whether it's Grants.gov, Fastlane, uh, SAM, um, any sort, if it looks like there's some sort of arduous registration process involved, it probably means the institution has to apply on your behalf. So 
that's when you call my office and say, hey, I'm thinking about applying, or you email me successively over the course of three days and tell me I'm thinking of applying here to the deadline. And um, we'll make an appointment and you'll come in and we'll, I'll make sure you have everything you need to be able to um, log in, to be able to submit easily, and no problems. It's usually federal funders that require um, you to be registered in some of these bigger online systems. So that being said, you can imagine what, step, what a federal governmental online submission application system will be like. They tend to not be um, the friendliest of interface. Um, they tend to not be intuitive, and they tend to ask you for questions with acronyms so that um, ask you for information in an acronym form. And if you don't know what the heck they're talking about, that's an awesome, just ask us. Chances are we've encountered it. If we haven't encountered it before, because every, you know, we do get that too. Students say, hey, I'm applying for this thing. And we get it, we're like, whew, never seen one of those before. You've also got to give us enough time to move, move it through whatever registration system it needs to go through and, and, and to, make it, to make it happen. Okay, um, uh, for all of you, I don't care what level you're at, you should be writing pretty much every day. Um, there are certain professors that you will find who are just fantastic at writing grants, and we usually find in any academic department, there are one or two professors who are just cranking them out. Like, they are just, you know, everyone else has this many submissions, and then, whoo, there's this one or two professors who just have this kind of way of do, just, I don't know, they're like on a treadmill getting all those, those uh, applications out. And in working with them, what I, they, they find it easy because they're in practice. It's never easy. They find it um, less time consuming because they're in practice of writing in the style that's necessary to put in a proposal. For the most part, if you're applying to a foundation or to another funder that has a more general, um, we fund student, you know, we fund graduate students in a variety of social sciences kind of uh, priority, take a look and see who's going to be reviewing your proposal because that's really going to help you in how you pitch the language and the description of your actual research. Um, a lot of funders have their advisory boards deciding who are the who are the, the who they're going to fund, especially if they're smaller family foundations or private foundations. Um, and so, in that way, you will want to pitch your um, you want it to pitch your research in a way that is as jargon free as possible, and one that will. <sighs> Walk the line of describing your research accurately and also talking about what perhaps the broader impacts of the research will be. You know, how, how will it benefit fit your, um, your discipline, but also does it have the potential to benefit society as well, um, even if it's in a small way or an incremental way. So, uh, those are the kind of things that you may want to talk about, especially if you're, if you see that your review group, your reviewer group is going to be folks who are not necessarily within your discipline. Um, you should take about 120, it takes about 120 hours to prepare the narrative of a federal application. So think of it as working full time three weeks on this. Most of the time people don't make this their job for three weeks. They do it over a longer course and you know. And some of it you've already written, so we're just gonna put that out there. But if you were to start from scratch and have nothing written and go beginning to end, it'll take you about three weeks to like, uh, just this is all you do to write it. Um, most people take that amount of time to write the narrative. My job is to say the narrative is a very important piece of it, but there are a whole bunch of other pieces to the application that you need to have. Um, usually they include things like 
um, a specifically formatted CV or bio sketch for yourself and if you're a student, also usually your advisor, your committee, or your partners or project team if you're doing collaborative research. Um, it usually sometimes will include, you have to cite all your references, you'll have your references piece there. You will have um, uh, the favorite, the abstract or overview summary of the research, so the one pager, especially in federal applications. In a federal application, you have up to 15 pages to write your project description, but you must do this one page or three paragraph summary in a very specific format. Um, and if you don't do it in that format, you will go through all of this and try to put it through a system and they will reject it and not review it. So I guess the best advice I can give you is to read the guidelines and like really read the guidelines and waste paper and print them out and have them next to you when you're writing it because it tells you exactly the order in which the reviewers want things answered. It tells you exactly which questions they need answered it tells you exactly which pieces you need to have in addition to your narrative. Um, all right, this, that's the depressing information. <laughs> <laughs> the good information for political science is there are people who are funding political science these days. And um, since I deal specifically with external, um, my background is um, doing federal program, working with federal programming. And um, so I tend to look to the federal government first. I look to the federal government first for a couple of reasons. One, they tend to have more money to give away within certain disciplines than, say, a private foundation. They just have a bigger overall budget, so why not take it if you can? Um, also, there are certain specific funders that we tend to look at, like the Social Science Research Council. They do interesting the way they give their money away is interesting, and the, the format that that money comes in is, to me, very interesting. They have, so the SSRC, Social Science Research Council, has international fellowships. So if you're traveling anywhere to do your work and you're going to be gone for nine months or more, apply. It's a good size fellowship. Now, I'm sorry, but I've forgotten the amount. It's over $20,000. That's a nice size fellowship. The other thing that's nice about SSRC is if you get a second fellowship from someone else, they don't make you, they don't reduce your fellowship. They just ask, could you please give us a budget that says you're not double dipping on both, but you can keep the full amount that we're going to give you. You know, so I like SSRC. So they have an international fellowship, they have a, a dissertation research fellowship, and then this one is my favorite for you folks who have now are on the verge of completing a um, dissertation proposal. If you have not yet fully in stone completed your dissertation proposal, they have a really fantastic competition that you, um, you are assigned um, um, two mentors who work with you in uh, May and probably into June for a few weeks one-on-one -on, -one on your dissertation proposal. And then they give you money to go away for the summer and go work, do research. And then you come back in the fall and you have another couple of weeks um, in September where you do another workshop and revise your um, research design. And it isn't a tremendous amount of money. It's $5,000 to do your summer research, but it's enough. What's valuable about it is the two people who it's their job to be your mentor and do really serious one-on-one -on -one and project design. Um, it gives you enough, and they, the timing of it means that you can still defend it in the fall. So the goal is between May and September, you refine that dissertation proposal to the point that when you go to that in the fall you're ready to defend it and just go full on to level three and doing the work and being done and out of here. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, 
one place, I'm not sure if political science students really, some know, and I feel like it's hit or miss, some know and some don't know. The National Science Foundation has a whole division of social, behavioral, and economic sciences. If you're at the dissertation phase, I do not believe you need to be a U.S. citizen. If you're postdoc, you do not need to be a U.S. citizen, which is helpful for some. Um, they also have uh, a whole, um, so aside from their political science department, they also have a division of law and science, and um, science, technology, and society, and other divisions within, and funding opportunities within uh, what they call cross-cutting research, where I think political science might find, depending on your project, you might find opportunities that align well with what you do. Um, and like I said, they, they'll have more money. Uh, National Institute of Justice, if you're doing anything that has to do with um, any sort of criminal activity, they just had a new one too, what was I just reading? I have another one that's, that I was reading earlier and thought, oh, I, I need to remember to tell the political science people about the National Institute of Justice. If you take a look, they have fellowships, um, they definitely have fellowships there that could be of use to anyone here. Um, what else is good? The Public Fellows Program for ACLS, for a new PhD, uh, fellows for a new PhD, that's a nice one. Uh, it's a two-year fellowship at $65,000. That's a good one. Take a look at that. Um, I also uh, think that you can start thinking about things sort of library grants. Most people are not looking at the library. Library, um, the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Sciences and just the federal library system has fellowships for people to go and work at university and presidential libraries. So if you're at the point of you need to go to somewhere and work on a collection, explore that. Um, also take a look at foundations that will come up when you do your search um, that might immediately not, you might look at that one and think, maybe not, like Hudson, the Hudson River uh, group. They're, they do environmental, um, so they're, they're very much an environmental science group, but there's this whole public policy aspect to it that when you first look at their um, when you first look at their offerings for, for for grants, you might not that might not immediately come to mind. Um, you can also, if you if you're working in any specific area, make sure that when you do your search, you search for that area, not just the sort of maybe theory or content of your research. Um, places like the Humboldt Foundation that fund research in Germany or the National Endowment for the Humanities that funds a lot of research in Japan. Um, uh, what else? There are a lot of weird places that you can also look. I'm thinking of like Department of Energy. They have more money than, probably, than, than a lot of the federal agencies. Um, and they recently are really interested in supporting um, doctoral students. But again, it's going to depend on exactly what you're doing. Here's what I caution against. You're reading a fellowship, you know, uh, one of the guidelines for the fellowships, and it's almost what you do, but not quite. And you think, you know what, I could just tweak it a little. And I could just spin it. If you start, if words like tweak or spin or something are coming up in your head as you're reading this, I could just shift a little, <coughs> put it to the bottom of the pile. Keep looking. Like, you know, take that one and say, okay, maybe. Put that in the maybe pile. You want to get something that is as closely aligned with your research as possible. You have to think that, to some degree, your research is pretty unique. And if you really want to go, that's exactly what I do, 
then that's the one you should be applying for because right there your application is going to be more competitive than the 10 other applications who thought this is almost what I do but I need to tweak it a little. So really look for something that's a good match. If you find just a pile of maybes then make an appointment with me and we'll go over them and see which one is the least maybe and the most yes. Because then what I can do is start looking at, well, who did they fund last round? What are the projects? Who's, and, you know, things like, well, hmm, let's do some work. Let's look and see who's on their board. What other boards are they on? What are they, like, you start doing a, a much more uh, research on the institution to really be able to try and figure out if that's, if they really do align with what you do. Because if they say what they're looking at is environmental public policy, but when you look at what they funded for the last five years and everyone that they funded has been, you know, some other form of, like, food security, then you're like, yeah, maybe not me. That one's less maybe. More no. Throw it out. Um, okay. We're good so far? Um, so let's say you found a couple. And you think, all right, they're pretty good. The whole goal in writing a research, um, writing a di uh, grant proposal that's different than writing a research proposal or writing a dissertation proposal is the whole point of the proposal is to give the reviewer confidence, enough confidence to invest in what you're doing. It's the pitch, you know? So there is this element of selling, and I'm sorry to say, but it is. You're asking someone to buy and do what you're doing. Um, so how do you do that? If it is the type of proposal that usually funds level one students, where it is a fellowship for your early stage of your, um, for the early stage of your graduate career, it's going to rest a lot on your personal statement. They usually ask for a personal statement, what's your previous research experience or previous experience, and your proposed research. Those are usually the three elements of that kind of proposal. And they also usually ask for things like letters of, commit, uh, letters of recommendation. Um, sometimes they ask for transcripts. Um, they're looking for anything that's going to be able to invest in you as an individual. To say, this person has potential to go out there and do great research. And they're going to look at your research too, because how you describe your research really lets them know how you think and why you think it's important um, and how it fits into your field. How are you going to contribute to your field? Um, one of the other things that they're looking at is, are you at the right school to do what you want to do? So in those descriptions, one of the things you also have to make sure that you mention is, I'm at the Graduate Center for X, Y, and Z reason. Um, and this is why I chose it. It, al 